Welcome to another episode of Fortitude and Truth. My name is Nate, and I'm not here this week with my brother-in-law, Andrew. Um, This week he is on vacation, but we wanted to keep the show cadence. And so we're going to do a solo show this week with just me. So it might be a little bit short, um, but we're going to try and keep the same format for you just to to keep things going. Next week uh, he will be back, and I believe we're going to be finally starting a new series uh, we're going to do some academia today and we're going to start talking about worship. And I think that's an important topic. And we hinted last week, um, that I preached one of my first sermons or my first sermon, I think on worship and Andrew over the week decided to challenge me to go back and review that sermon. And I did, and it was super uncomfortable. And somehow the findings led me to today's topic, which is different than not just worship. Uh, I think it goes along with worship a little bit, but it's a little bit different. And so we're going to start with the focus verse of today, and that is, or of the week, or whatever you want to call it, is Psalm 133. And I'm going to give you the whole psalm because it's just three verses. And it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the head, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And so if you haven't guessed off of that verse, uh, what I want to talk about today is unity. And I think if we're going to title this show, I think titling it The Call for Unity is is really a good fitting sort of thing. Um... Because that's one of the things I found in the sermon after reviewing uh, a sermon on worship. And I think it was, for the most part, topically pretty sound as far as how worship really encompasses your whole life. And how, you know, it's not just singing, it's not just dancing. But there were some things in there that, that I have kind of backed off of. And one of those is some of my being critical of other denominations. And so that's where where today's topic really stems from, is that I don't, I think at a certain point when scripture is clear, we need to be clear. And so certain things cannot or should not be tolerated. And some things, while we may disagree, are worth healthy discussion. And that's where I think the church today really needs to hear that. And I think myself included, I I think I've come a long way in that, but I don't think I have arrived at... Um, being at a place where I am comfortable saying that I'm wholly unified with all my brothers in Christ of all these different denominations, because there's some things um, and preconceived notions that I hang on to as well. And so that's really tough. But that's one thing I think to, to clarify before we even get too far into this discussion on unity, is it's not just unity for unity's sake. And that's where we really run amok is with unity, we want to be, I mean, Scripture calls for unity. We're called to be the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is is called to be one. In the New Testament, there's many um, different depictions of that, and Paul's especially good at, at depicting the body of Christ as really a body, that Christ is the head, and everything else kind of fits into that. And so, realistically, if we are unified for unity's sake, are we even unified at all? And that's, I think that's the question that really we need to ask ourselves is what's more important, truth or unity? And I think that's not an easy answer. We'd, we'd love to say that either unity is more important or truth is more important. And I would humbly submit, based on the title of the show, among other things, that truth is more important. But truth is... Uh, in love, speak, especially speaking the truth in love, um, does not preclude one from being unified with others. Realistically, speaking the truth in love should draw unity and should promote unity. It should not discourage it. And so that's, I think, what we talk about when we say, you know, unity for unity's sake is the other side of that coin is, well, we're not even speaking the truth in love. We're glossing over things and we're ignoring things and we're just being unified for the sake of unification. 
And that's not healthy either. If we think of that in other terms, if we look at like affirmation and the way things are going in the world as far as the, the homosexual agenda of, of what is love and like compassion versus condemnation, where do we draw the line and what is acceptable as far as what shows support and what is affirming and what is us trying to just speak the truth in love? And it's not an easy line. And there's a lot of gray area there. And I think that's the things we do need to reconcile in scripture. But if we're just going to blindly affirm, then are we really loving or speaking the truth at all? And if we're going to speak the truth, if we're not speaking it love, then we're going to destroy everything that goes along with unity and compassion. So I think really you can't have one without the other to do it correctly. But again, it's, it's, it's letting Scripture define our terms, like what is truth. Scripture defines what truth is, and truth is Jesus Christ. And the words of the Scripture are true. And what is unity? What does the Scripture define as unity? It's pretty, pretty clear that, you know, we are one body. We're not a hundred bodies. We're not a hundred thousand bodies. We are one body. And so we get this idea, and theologians often call it church universal, and really, we should see ourselves that way. Yes, I am a member of my local church, but am I a member of my local church that is the only church that's the right church? Or am I a member of my local church that fits into the cogs of the church universal, of the body of Christ universal? Do we cross those borders or do we not? And that's, we, that's a question we need to ask ourselves, is does my church see that? see itself that way? Do members of my church see itself that way? And is that worth um, compromising? Because there are a lot of churches out there that, and a lot of denominations that say, oh, well, we got it right. No one else has it right. And I would caution you, if you go to a church like that or a denomination like that, to really search the scriptures as to what that says. You know? And, cause there's, a, and there's a big difference, too, between error and heresy. And we don't want to we don't want to teach it heresy, and we really don't want to teach error, but error, how do we define error, and how do we define truth, and what is, subject, what is, you know, what is debatable in the Bible, you know? I would say at some point, if we look at, especially if we want to talk like eschatology and the end times, if my brother thinks that amillennialism is the way, and I am a premillennialist, do I throw him out of the church because he's an error or I think he's an error. Uh, well, the the question is, is his argument scriptural? Is it based on scripture? And I think that's the first place to start is I'm like amillennialists, for example, would, would a lot of their arguments are founded in scripture, but so is premillennialism and, and to a certain extent, postmillennialism, although I would argue that's less scriptural, but in any case, if there's exegetically sound scripture behind your argument, then the question is, is that interp- where do we get the interpretation of scripture to say we're right and we're wrong? And that's where like these things are secondary. They're not important to our salvation. If they were important to our salvation, they'd be clear. Um, I know he's caught a lot of fire lately from some of the, the things he said, if you've not heard. Uh, but Alistair Begg again says, the plain things are the main things, and the main things are the plain things. So if it's not plain, then perhaps it is secondary. And yes, we should have a biblically informed opinion about these things. And we should really search the scriptures for what we believe on certain things and let scripture define what we believe on certain things. But ultimately, because we're inherently sinful and we all come to scripture with presuppositions that no matter how hard we try to crucify and put down, we can't. And so those lead us to these different interpretations of the Bible. In, in certain aspects. But again, the central things and the central tenets are central for a reason, and we have to agree on those. But that's what those t- central tenets are what should unify us. And that's where I get so bent out of shape sometimes about, like, people want to say, oh, we have it right. Like, yes, you have it right, so do I. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. We, we agree on that. And that's where we should we should stand together. We do. We disagree on the spiritual gifts. We disagree on eschatology. We disagree on on church government or ecclesiology, which is the study of the church, which is kind of part of church government. We we disagree on those things. So what? If our if if our practices and our applications of a, a true 
interpretation of scripture are sound, whether we whether those interpretations are different is not really the issue at this point. Again, we should this is hard to to kind of really flesh out in words, but we really should when you're interpreting scripture should always be led by scripture. So, and that's and things shouldn't dramatically change, I would say, but we should always always submit our opinions to scripture. And 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 I'll give you an example of of some things that I've really struggled with um as far as secondary issues is is the gift gifts of the spirit. Um I mean I was raised, you know, I went to a Lutheran Lutheran school, but I was raised in a charismatic church and so you see the practice or um the promotion of these charismatic gifts of healing of tongues of uh, dreams and visions and you know something and and i i believe that some of these gifts are active and the question is how much and i don't know that i can answer that question um, but i believe that those gifts serve a purpose and um, ideally enough though part of the purpose of those gifts is to unify the church it's not to drive it apart because god gave the holy spirit as a gift in its in himself to strengthen and build his church with us here on earth for Christ his son for his return and and the church will be his bride. And so if we don't accept that the gifts are active and how they're active and that they do serve a purpose, then we need to be careful. On the flip side, they, they serve a purpose. So if gifts are being used and are not serving those biblical purposes, then maybe we need to question them. And so that's some of the experiences I had is these gifts were not edification of the church. They were edification of self. They were edification of the gifts. They were they caused divisions among members of a, of a, a local church. And and those were big issues that really really stuck out as maybe there's there's some issues here. And that unfortunately led me emotionally mostly because of those presuppositions to the other side of the pendulum which is cessationism, which is the charismatic gifts are dead, and they were only for the apostolic age, which was um, after Christ had risen and ascended. Um, basically, Acts, basically in Acts, like that's really the apostolic age. Once those guys, Peter, Paul, uh, all the apostles, passed on, that the, these gifts ceased to exist. And you know that felt good emotionally because oh, you know, these things just were all fake. And it's so it's easy to just label them like sweeping with a sweeping generalization. But on the flip side, is as I've kind of grown and matured in my interpretations of scripture and really understanding the the purpose of the gifts that like maybe these things aren't maybe these things do exist. You know, I don't. So I would I would argue that cessationism is not wholly biblical, though there are some interesting ideas in there we can glean from it. And in the same way, continuationists, um, a lot of whom are charismatic. Or is not also wholly biblical, just because of the way they you, way they use gifts in practice. I think, but and the emphasis they put on gifts, and you kind of get this divide of like subpar Christians, or uh, one textbook I read says varsity and junior varsity Christians, um, based on if they could speak in tongues. And so there's those are that's problematic though. And so the real answer is somewhere in the middle, and it's tough to find. It really is. And I don't know that I have the answer. I don't know that anybody does. That's why there's books upon books upon books about the um, gifts of the Spirit and how the Spirit works and knowing the Spirit and being led by the Spirit. But so often they just disagree. And they, but we need to just let Scripture lead. And that's that's really my point in this is for unity's sake, we need to let Scripture lead. So for me, finding that middle ground and allowing scripture to lead and really showing me that the purpose to to help guide me in identifying authentic gifts is really uncovering what scripture says is the purpose of those gifts. And and so that's all that to say is I've swung from both ends of the spectrum from one to the other and I've found myself somewhere in the middle. And realistically, a lot of the the, the, the divides we we carry that have really divided Christian denominations and divided faith systems in, in Christ, within Christianity. Um, we could say the same thing of like salvation of um, like Calvinists and, and reform the reform churches and versus like Arminian the, the more Arminian churches. And again, t- 
to me, it's somewhere in the middle. Biblically, it's somewhere in the middle. And the, but the problem is, is sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, like a Calvinist would say, he's like, he's so entrenched that, oh, Arminians are wrong. Well, the question is, are they wrong in going to hell or are they wrong and we can get past this? And some churches and some people can't get past that. And that's, I think, a problem. Because even if we disagree on kind of the the semantics, I guess, of salvation a little bit, um, and the, or the human role in salvation, maybe that's what we could say. Um, the fact of the matter is we all agree on Jesus saves and that the price he paid to save us was the same. And that in either Arminianism or Calvinism, really, if they're biblically sound, that we couldn't save ourselves. And all that's, all that's in scripture. So if we all agree on these central things, why are we divided? And it's, it's so hard to see. It really is. But if we really just focus on, if we let Scripture really lead us, it should help lead us. This truth should guide us into unity and, and not necessarily vice versa. I'd love to say that unity would lead you into truth, but, I mean, the, the Spirit will lead you into all truth, and truth really should, should drive you to unity. And this this is kind of a twofold approach and so we can we can take this a couple different ways but i would say firstly when when we talk about unity do we have unity in our own local bodies because i've i've spent the first in like intro we've kind of fleshed out not being unified for the sake of unity but are our churches themselves like seeking to be unified in itself and that's that's a tough thing because people in general are different I would say that most people within a given church have a different spectrum of beliefs. And I would say depending on the church, that's a wider spectrum or a more narrow spectrum. Uh, for my own local personal church, um, being basically interdenominational or non-denominational, there is a group broader spectrum because there are people who've either left a denomination or don't want to be bound by a, com a denomination and, and things are taught here in such a way that like multiple options are very often presented, especially when we get to, to difficult topics or things where scripture is not clear, where we present multiple options based on different historical and current interpretations of scripture that are supported. And then the, the duty relies on the parishioners to really find and search the scriptures for themselves. And they may not all come to an agreement on those points, but there's two things happening there. It's one, as long as they're doing what they're told, and or as long as they're doing what they should be doing, and really searching the scriptures to, to come to the, the knowledge of the truth themselves, that they are growing in their biblical knowledge, they are growing more biblical in their actions, and they are becoming conformed to the likeness of Christ, and that's the goal. Now, the uh, and the other side of things, they could entrench themselves in their already preconceived beliefs, and those things happen. But that that's those things; those are things that divide a church. That if you know, if all of us you know, at this non-denominational church were so entrenched in our beliefs, like it would rip apart at the seams. No matter how, no matter what pastor is here to try and control it, it would rip apart the seams. Like if you had a small group of Christian nationalists who were so entrenched in their Christian nationalism that they basically started a coup within the church, like that's just going to rip it apart. But we need to, but if we are being led in all truth, we should be patient with our brothers and sisters. We should speak the truth and love to our brothers and sisters. And again, that should drive us to unity, not to division. And I very often, and I, I speak personally for myself in this instance, so I don't speak for anybody who is on staff at my current church. Um, when I teach, one of the things I've done lately is I refrain from giving my opinion. Um, I've, I've taught a couple kind of controversial passages. They're not necessarily controversial, but they lead into controversial topics a little bit. And, and so like... I'll just give them a couple options. I'll give them, hey, like, here's what a couple, here's what you could believe, here's what you could believe. And then here's some questions you should ask yourself. Like, 
what what does this passage say about like what does this passage teach me about God? What does this passage have to do with the rest of the canon of Scripture? What does this passage have to do with like if it's like a Pauline letter? Like Paul said this in Colossians, but what did he say in Philippians about this? What did he say in Galatians about this? And so you're getting them to to think about all these things, and then on the flip side too, to add to that, maybe not necessarily on the flip side. Um, I also don't want to be the distraction because I could give you my opinion and and on this show, you'll get my opinion probably more than you would in um, a teaching setting at my current church or even in future churches. You would probably get more from me here on this podcast. Um, but I don't want, we've said this before on, on, on this show that I don't want my opinions to be divisive. I don't want, and I, that's not because they're not going to be divisive, but I don't want them to be, get in the way. I don't want them to be a distraction. I don't want them to cloud the gospel. I don't want them to cloud the truth. And so if my opinions are wrong, even if they're my opinions, that as long as the the gospel really needs to take forefront, the scripture needs to take a forefront. And if my opinions just detract from that, then I need to, to refrain from them. And they may not, it may be sharing them may not detract from them, but in certain circumstances they might. Because I might say something, and somebody might agree with me, and they're like, "Oh, well, my pastor agrees with me, and now I don't need to study the scripture. I'm just going to entrench myself in this in this viewpoint." And what if I'm wrong? And then this person is now entrenched themselves in this view, viewpoint that is an error, and leads them down a path that is more hazardous to their their Christian walk than if I had just refrained from saying anything. And they continue to search the scriptures, and and in being informed of the likeness of their son, their opinions slowly change towards what is actual truth, you know? So I don't I don't want to do that. And that's not unity for unity's sake. It, it might sound like it a little bit, um, but it's not like I'm not giving multiple options. It's not like I'm like, oh, here's, here's the other option that I don't agree with, but I'm not going to tell you what I agree with. Like, I'll tell them what I agree with. I just won't tell them that I agree with it. And, I, and I'll phrase it in a way where, hey, there's this viewpoint, this viewpoint, this viewpoint. And you need to make heads or tails of that and search the scripture and pray about it on your own. Because I can't give you the answers. And I shouldn't be the one giving you the answers. The Holy Spirit should be the one giving the answers. And the more I study, the more I realize that he gives the answers. <laughs> I was, um, I don't want to segue too much. I was prepping my sermon. I, I, I preached at my local church this week. And... I spent hours and hours reading commentaries and parsing Greek words and and ripping apart this passage. And I was just, I was stuck. Like I had hit a wall. Like I couldn't come up with an outline. I couldn't decide what I wanted to preach on. I couldn't really exposit this correctly. Like I know what the passage means. There was no, I mean, to me in my mind, it's rather clear what the passage means, but the question is, how do I preach this and exposit this? And I, I couldn't figure it out. And finally, at like the last resource I had on my list, because I usually do that before I, I start prepping, it's like, I'll make a list of, hey, I want to read these commentaries. I want to read a couple of these authors. I want to make sure I do the, I want to parse these Greek words. Or I want to, you know, do an outline in Greek. And so I'll do all that. And then I get to like the last resource that I want to read. And it gives me all the answers. And I was like, this is not even fair. Like if I had started, but if I had started with that, then I would have missed all the stuff I had learned along the way. And learning all the stuff I learned along the way really helped to to shape that sermon into what was ultimately, I mean, I would hope was successful. But again, that's not up to me. It's up to God and and those who heard the word and, and doing something with it are, that's up to them. And so I did my job and tried to faithfully handle the word. And now it's on those who heard it. So, but again, just to be unified in-house is essential from the top down. The pastors, multiple pastors, all the pastors obviously would need to be unified, need to to show that um, commitment to truth, commitment to unity, to commitment to the tr- speaking the truth in love is all these things are super, super important. Um, and so if your leadership is doing these things, then it's kind of should be, it's not a perfect system, 
should be a kind of trickle down effect, right? Especially if not only are your leaders living it, or not only are they teaching like unity and speaking the truth and love, but they're living it. So there's no gaps between their teaching and their living. That should kind of find its way into the body of Christ. It may take time. It does take time. These aren't not perfect sciences. And and changes, especially in church, are slow. And that's okay. Because lasting change usually is slow. If, if it's emotional, it's a lot of these like drastic changes. They're not always, sometimes they are, and, and praise God. But they're not always sustainable. Because it's emotional. It's emotionally driven or it's driven by you know, quid pro quo consequences or ultimatums. And we don't want any of that. We want lasting change that conforms us all to the likeness of Christ. So I would say um, on this hill, I don't want to die, but a call for unity is not a, just not just interdenominational. It's it's within your own church. It's within your own house. It's within your the four walls. It's within your own community. How can you, your local church community be unified for Christ is the long short of it. And that's, and again, you're going to disagree with people. I disagree with people in my own local church all the time. And we have, sometimes we have healthy conversations and sometimes we don't have healthy conversations. And, and so we need to really soul search on how do we have healthy conversations about things we disagree about and how do we either, and how do we know what to say, when to say, and when to, to sometimes just be silent and shut up. And again, those are things I can't give anybody the answer to because I think that's that's between you and God to really reconcile the truth of Scripture and how to be able to speak the truth in love and be unified but also be truthful is is probably the hardest part of church life. Um, there's a lot of the church life can get messy, unfortunately, and that is probably one of the hardest parts of, of, of doing life together in the church is how do we do that and still be unified? How do we disagree and be unified? And that's the hardest thing I think I've ever had to learn is because usually when you disagree, you're not unified, but somehow we can disagree on things and still be unified and we should disagree on things. And well, we shouldn't disagree on things, but we do and it's inevitable. But how can we be unified in, in, in spite of that? Because we agree on the more important things. There are more important things we agree on than we disagree right? There's stuff I disagree with my wife on, right? We disagree on what TV shows we like. We disagree on the foods we like. But if we didn't agree to love each other for the rest of our lives, then we wouldn't be unified. But we've agreed and made the commitment to love our love each other for the rest of our lives. So you can throw everything else out the window because it doesn't matter, right? Because that simple fact that I've chosen to to live with my wife and love my wife till the day I die stands above everything else. And that that fact alone should unify us. I mean, of course, there are other things. There are plenty of things we get along with. And our faith in, our, in Christ unifies us. And so those two things, right? My commitment to her and my commitment to Christ and her commitment to her to me and her commitment to Christ and our collective commitment to Christ. I think all those things work together to unify us. But again, we don't, dis- we don't agree on everything. And, I, and I, would, I would submit, too, that I don't even think our theology... We agree wholly on our, our theologies. Obviously, I would say my wife is not as well um, studied. I teach her as much as I can, and, but it's not her calling. So she doesn't need to be, you know, my wife does not need to parse Greek words with me, if, if that makes any sense. Now, I can share that with her, and I do share that with her, and she kind of looks at me like, why are you telling me this stuff? You can tell me what it means without telling me the Greek. And so that's what I do. I tell her what it means without telling her the Greek. That's usually how I prep my sermons and my teaching. I, I like to involve the Greek. I like to use the Greek where it's appropriate. I think for the first time ever, I pre the sermon I preached recently, I don't even think I said anything about the Greek. I might have made a hint at it, but I didn't throw a Greek word in there, and that's the first time ever. And then, I, But I've prepped sermons where I try not to use a Greek, and I end up using a Greek. And this one I was kind of trying to hoping I could use a Greek word, and... It didn't happen, and it wasn't important. So, but that's 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 a side note. So, in any case, now you're gonna see so you're listening to me ramble, and I don't know if I've lost you yet. Hopefully, I've not. But my final, the final real section of this this episode is gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about inter interdenominational unity because I think that's just as important 
and it's a lot less talked about. Like we talk, we I'm sure we talk in plenty of churches talk about in house unity and being unified. But I wonder, and it's hard to to know the answer because I'm not in a bunch of different churches on Sundays. I'm in my church. That I wonder how many churches talk about interdenominational unity and really emphasize the body of Christ as being universal. Because I think oftentimes we, we fall into that trap of, well, he's talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about the local body. And we kind of, and maybe that's a Western thing, that we very self-identify, we self-identify a little bit. And so pastor will be preaching a sermon and he'll talk about the body of Christ. And we'll kind of just like make that linear assumption that oh he is referring to or scripture is referring to just this local body and that's it and not the church universal we we lose that but that's not true usually when we're talking about the body of christ yes the local body is included in that but it's so much bigger and so much greater and so much stronger than that and so that's important and one thing my church does and i really i think we've talked about it before but and i really really appreciate it and it's really kind of what ended up bringing me to this church through back channels is that this that my local church prays for another church of a different denomination or non-denominational church every single week and after that we follow it up with a letter and it's it's kind of a cookie cutter letter a little bit but it's literally it's from our senior pastor and i think it's it's addressed as the church a little bit but it's basically Hey, we just want to let you know that we prayed for you guys this week. We really want to encourage you um, in whatever it is you're doing. We're praying for you, um, you know, in, in being biblical and searching the scriptures and, and following truth and following Christ and promoting Christ and being evangelists. All all those kind of, you know, somewhat cliche but truthful Christian jargon, the Christianese. But the the fact of the matter is that we... We make, we set time aside every single Sunday at the beginning of service. Like our opening prayer includes this. Uh, we pray for another church and then we pray for one of the missionaries we support every single week. And these churches range in denominations from denominations that I would say are pretty much on the straight and narrow um, to denominations that are starting to falter a little bit um, to denominations that sometimes have fallen completely off the rails. And so the prayer looks a little different, but it's still a call to unity. It's still a call for the body of Christ. And so obviously for the the denominations that we see, and I'm not going to name them, um, but like that we believe are on the straight and narrow or seem to be as a whole typically on the straight and narrow, the the prayer will be a, more of a prayer of encouragement of, hey, we, we stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to encourage them. We want to strengthen them. Um if we get to denominations that are either fringe or kind of falling apart um, off the, the the straight and narrow path to kind of, you know, letting scripture be subjective and, and really compromising the truths of scripture, then that's really the, what the prayer kind of focuses on is, Hey, can bring, bring them back into all truth. Let scripture be their guide. Um, you know, continue to grow them in your likeness, which is really the call for everybody. But, sometimes they need that more. And so they may never hear that prayer and that's fine, but God hears our prayers. And so that's our call of, Hey, we, we know that everybody has struggles and we want them to succeed through those struggles, right? Because maybe that denomination, that denomination as a whole, or that church as a whole is really compromised scripture. We want to pray to encourage them to, to kind of get back to the roots of scripture and get back to the foundations of scripture, because that's what unifies us. Scripture unifies us. The truth unifies us. When you fall off the rails and start, you know, picking things out of Scripture and throwing things out of Scripture that you don't like, that's when disunity happens. And that's really disunity that probably should happen. Is right? We're talking unity for not for unity's sake. There, we start compromising things that certain things cannot and should not be compromised. And we get to that point, then then yeah, yes, we should speak the truth in love, but at a certain point then, um, you know, you follow Matthew 18's discipline if you need to, or um, at some point, I believe it's, it's a Paul or Jesus, there's all, uh, the section is titled, again, not inspired, is expel the immoral brother. And maybe that denomination becomes the immoral brother of, hey, they've they've openly stated that they want nothing to do with scripture, and scripture is 
completely subjective and and you can believe what you want to and it kind of gets into this universalist mindset and obviously at that point with scripture subjective then salvation is subjective and god is subjective and once those basic tenets of christianity are compromised then we're talking heresy and we're talking not christianity and that's where unity is is lost because it's not truth so there's a line there's definitely a line that that cannot and should not be crossed but again how we how we react to that line do we speak the truth in love do we pray for our enemies do we pray for our brothers and sisters do we do we seek to bring them back into all truth absolutely but as much as we try we may not win that one and so we we do those things i think that 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 prayer is important and i i would like to see more um, not just with our church, but in general, I would love to see. Um, I mean, there I know there's pastors' conferences all the time, and you get a lot of different pastors from different um, denominations that kind of gather together at these um, churches. But sometimes the viewpoints even seem to be. It depends on the the conference. I, I was at a conference uh, once. It was a primarily it was a reformed church, and most of the pastors were reformed. And sometimes comments were made about. Um, like evangelicals, it was like a sweeping generalization about all evangelicals. I was like, well, hold on a minute, because uh, technically I go to an evangelical church. And so like, we need to be careful with those sweeping generalizations too. Like, Just because they're reformed does not mean they're right. Just because they're evangelical does not mean they're wrong. I don't think those divides are fair. And I also think that, that people who make up denominations are kind of bigger than the denomination or should stand apart a little bit from the denomination when we make some of these generalizations. Like we might say that there are things about the Roman Catholic church that are really, really pushing the envelope on borderline heresy. And that's fair because the denomination and the Pope have have made those stances, but does everybody who is a Roman Catholic believe those things inherently like hook, line and sinker? I would think they probably don't. And so, yeah, there's probably plenty of Catholic people who don't believe whatever that might be. And so we would tend to say that those people would be, right, well, the denomination may be wrong and they may be headed in the wrong direction, they might be okay. The same thing with if we look at like the Methodist church and what's what's happened there lately with the big, I mean, you have female preachers and you've got God is transgender out of some of these United Methodist churches and it's really just a debacle and scripture is basically nowhere to be found at, at this point. Like scripture is so subjective in, in the United Methodist church that it's it's really a cause for concern. And, but again, that's the United Methodist church as a whole. And yes, the Methodist Church is split, so those denominations that don't agree with the direction of the Methodist Church have pretty much broken away, which is which is good. They should have. I mean, that's that's a, that I think is an instance where disunity is good because it's for the sake of truth. Um, at least, hopefully, it is, and it seems to be that way. I, I want to be careful drawing too hard and fast lines here. So take that for what it's worth. I'm trying to 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 not draw too hard and fast lines because I still want to talk about people. But again, there are probably people in the United Methodist Church, and and this may be a, might be a little bit more of a stretch, but there are probably there might be some people in the United Church, United Methodist Church who are genuinely saved, who genuinely believe in Christ, and who are just struggling with with either finding a new church or struggling with with certain aspects that that they really need prayer and encouragement. And how do we find them? And how do we reach them? And how do we lead them into all truth. So we just need to be careful. Like if somebody comes up to you and says, Hey, I'm a United Methodist, like don't let that identification be a red flag, right? Actually talk to them, get to know them, find out what they believe. And if they're wrong, then, then help lead them into truth and speak the truth and love to them. If they're, but if they're, they're questioning a whole lot of stuff that's going on in the Methodist church, then just encourage them to continue to, to search the scriptures. Really, that's really, the call should be either way, whether, whether they believe the, the Methodist church hook, line, and sinker, or they're, they're questioning things or whatever they are doing. Like, that should probably be it. Just search the scriptures and, and speak the truth and love to them because that, that's going to do basically two things. It's either going to bring, hopefully, transform them into the likeness of Christ and continue to to bring them into the into all truth which is unifying or if they've become if they've they're at the point where they've rejected Christ then it's going to just harden their heart potentially 
right? But we don't we don't get to make that distinction. That's not our job. I don't get to choose who gets to harden their heart and who gets to get saved. That's up to them, and that's between them and God, and that's how the Holy Spirit works in them. It, my job is to preach the gospel at all times. My job is to speak the truth in love. As all of ours is. Like if we're Christians, that's your job, right? Is to speak the truth in love and preach the gospel at all times. You don't get to dictate the response. You don't get to dictate if they respond, when they respond, how they respond. That's not up to you. And it shouldn't matter. Like, yes, praise God, everyone who gets saved. I, I love hearing stories when people get saved. I love hearing and being encouraging in that. But if I... This, this sounds bad, but, I, but I'm going to say it. And maybe once it leaves my mouth, I, I will recant it. But like, if I never found out if a single gut person got saved from anything that I had ever said, I don't care, right? Hopefully they do. Absolutely. But if I, because, but if I can't wreck, like if my conscience is clear before God, that I am preaching the gospel at all times, that I am living a lifestyle of repentance, that I am walking the Christian faith, that I'm becoming transformed to the likeness of God. And again, not, I'm not perfect. I'm not touting to be. And I don't know that I'm even at this place right now, but I would love to say that, yes, I want everybody I, whoever hears me talk to get saved. I absolutely, I do. But do I need to hear that from anybody? No. Like, praise God over every person who gets saved again. Praise God. Absolutely. But I I just have concerns that, like, you tell me I it was because of me you got saved. Like, don't put that on me. I don't want that on me because that's that's... That scares me because then I'm worried my pride's going to take off. I'm like, oh man, I got these all these people saved. I must be something special. Like I am not something special. I I will never be something special. The only reason I am anything special is because God has made me that way and God has given me these gifts and and he really he's the special one and he just hopefully shines through me and it's him they see and not me, right? It's the hardest thing. Everybody, you hear people compliment you sometimes. It's like, well, praise God that that you you got something out of what I taught because it's not me. Like if it were me, it'd be a whole different different story. So, like I get that I have a role and I get that I have to be a workman, but I really want to leave room to give glory to God because it's this is all Him. But all this to be said, and, and I've probably rambled a ton here on on some different issues, so maybe we'll never ever do a solo show again. But this is this is my call to anybody who's listening, no matter what denomination you are in, is to set aside and be able to set aside secondary issues and let what's primary unite us. I mean, Scripture's clear that that's really what should unite us. Is why we should be united. And I, I've heard R.C. Sproul say it. It's actually etched on our windows here at this church. Is in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. Right. So charity, speak the truth in love in all things. In non-essential matters, liberty. We have the freedom to believe different things without it affecting our salvation because they're not essential matters. But again, all these terms in the, in that saying should all be defined by Scripture. So liberty is defined by Scripture. Unity is defined by Scripture. Charity is defined by Scripture. What is essential and not essential is defined by Scripture. And sometimes it's difficult to determine. But the more plain it is in Scripture, and maybe it is a little bit sliding, of a sliding scale, but like what is more plain in Scripture and what is re- more readily apparent is more important. What is nuanced, what is hard to determine, what is the the subject of multiple interpretations is is perhaps less important sometimes, right? It, it should stand under the truth of, of the gospel, basically, because if Christ's sacrifice and his salvation message, right, and the fact that he did what he did for our salvation— and that we could not come to salvation ourselves, and that we were condemned in our sins. If that, if those central tenets of Christianity unify us, then the rest is just details. That sounds cliche, and I think I borrowed that from somewhere, but it, the rest is just details. Yes, all of Scripture should inform our Christian walk, and all of our Scripture, all Scripture can teach us about who God is. But what is clear should stay clear, and what is nuanced should be continually, I mean, really should be continually studied and just allow the Spirit to speak. But we should have our cornerstone on Christ, 
right? He's the cornerstone, and he should be the foundation of that builds upon everything. Because if he's not the foundation that builds on everything, then we let our own sinful opinions run us amok, and that's how we got from basically one church when Christ ascended to, I mean, it's still one church, but now we're the subject, especially since, like, the Great Schism and, and the like, especially since, like, modern technology and everything, just massive amounts of denominations and non-denominations. And so how do we get back to being unified? And I don't know that I have a clear answer to that, but I would say find ways to connect. If you're listening to this, I would say find ways to connect with brothers and sisters in other churches. I think that is the simplest way that we can build the body of Christ and strengthen the body of Christ as the church universal in your own in your own context. I would love to to be able to put together conferences in my in my local church that we're working through right now and maybe get some local churches to kind of corroborate and hey, we can do this every year. And so like we get a whole bunch of local churches together. It would be great. Um for my ordination, I was um the the pastors that served on my ordination council. Yes, there were some of my local body, but we invited pastors of a couple different churches um in the area who have a spectrum of, of beliefs on secondary issues. And so that was a little refreshing and it, but it was wonderful. It was such a great time of conversation and really, really feeling unified. And I, I, I truthfully was nervous because they're, especially the churches that were the pastors were attendants. Like I get nervous because, because of my history, but that's me being sinful. Right. And so I was refreshingly awakened to the fact that we can disagree on certain things and still come together and just talk about God and talk about Christ and all the wonderful things he's done and all the things he's doing in this ch- in his church right now and it was just such a wonderful time and but that's possible with any christian right they don't have to be at your church you don't have to single them out there could be christians in your neighborhood right that you don't even know about they go for a walk one day you start talking to somebody find out they go to another church that's great like build a relationship with them it's okay, right? No one should judge you for that, right? It's it's okay, and we should be probably members of one local body. We don't want to be church hopping. I think there's there's something to that too. Um, I think that that development of relationships is important, but I also think that having relationships with other Christians outside your local church body is important. And so finding ways to do that may not necessarily be the easiest, but do it, you know? I'm, it's possible, especially with technology these days. It is it is very, very possible, and there's there's different. I know there's like a community Bible study in this area that meets. It meets at our church, but it, there's um, I believe that there's just members of every of local congregations. It's like it's community Bible study. It's not this church's Bible study. Um, and I, I think that those those can be helpful too. I'm sure you could look online. You can find Facebook groups. You can find uh, man technology today. You can find pretty much anything you want. Um, and I think any of that would be acceptable places to start. So that's that's my um, um, soapbox for today. Is is just how do we get back to being the church universal, and how do we preach the church universal, and how do we live being the church universal, and how do we be united as fellow Christians, and how do we? But how do we not forsake speaking the truth in love? I think that. Finding that answer in your own life is is of super importance. And I hope that I was able to give you some things that maybe helped you, maybe some food for thought. Um, I don't know that I gave you any real good answers. Unfortunately, I think I just tried to flesh a lot of stuff out um, <clears throat> for the sake of discussion. And I, I wish that my brother-in-law, Andrew, were here to have some more discussion on that. And we'll probably circle back to this and, and have some good discussion about it. But really, I would, my prayer for you and my hope for you if you're listening, is to just find that way to be unified and and seek unity with the body of Christ universal. How can you build up his church universal? And how can that help you can be conformed to the likeness of his son? And with that, we're going to bring this monologue to a close. I can't really say discussion when I'm talking to myself. Um, and so... We'll give you the verse one, the verses one more time, and that's Psalms 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, 
running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So I want to thank you, if you got this far, for putting up with me and listening to my voice all day today. Uh, Maybe next episode we'll let Andrew do most of the talking to give you guys a break. But in any case, if you do have any questions, comments, concerns, points of order, prayer requests, uh, we'd love to hear about them. Uh, FortitudeInTruth316 at gmail.com. Um, still working on through some, some things with our YouTube, maybe putting out some shorts, but for now, uh, podcast is available, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, uh, pretty much wherever you can find your podcast, you should be able to find us. Um, if you are listening to us somewhere than you would prefer to listen to us, uh, shoot me, shoot us an email. We'll see if we can make sure we get our podcast up on whatever site you would actually prefer to listen to us on. We'll be okay with that too. And so let's. Let's close in a brief word of prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for my brother Andrew, and we pray blessings on his time of rest and relaxation with his family. Lord, I know that he will come back just more and more eager to continue to serve you. And Lord, I pray for everybody listening that you would continue to just allow your spirit to work in all of us, to lead us into your truth, Lord, that you've revealed in your scriptures. We thank you so much that you've given us those gifts and Lord, let's just let us help us to use them to, for your purposes, Lord, that we might build and with the help of your spirit, build and grow your church for the return of your son. Lord, we look forward to that. And Lord, we, we just, we seek to be conformed to the likeness of him. And we know that you can help us get there. And in all these things we pray, Amen. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next week on Fortitude in Truth.